Hello, I'm Paul Harris, America's editor at Mining Journal. Welcome to this Mining Journal exclusive interview with Joe Mazumda of Exploration Insights. And today we're talking about M&A in the gold space. In addition to looking for opportunities as an investor, Joe's background includes working in corporate development for a major gold miner. So he's well practiced and knowledgeable about what companies are looking for and what make good acquisition targets. Good afternoon, Joe. Good afternoon, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get right into it. Recent months have seen a, a number of M&A transactions. So are we coming into a new M&A cycle? And if so, why is that? Well, I, I would say uh, yes, uh, in terms of when, when people are looking to grow or, you know, because we, if, if we look at a big company like Newmont, you know, um, they produce about six to six and a half million ounces a year. They require about seven to eight million ounces of reserves that they're depleting every year just to get that six and six and a half million ounces. So those are, that's, that's, that's almost two major mines a year that they go through every year to generate that six to six and a half million ounces. I think long-term they're thinking more than five to five and a half million ounces. Maybe that's a flat production rate, but still, you know, the ability to feed that uh, steady production profile requires, you know, a portfolio of reserves and assets. And uh, most of the exploration budget that they have, 230 million, is actually for brownfields, not for new greenfield stuff. And most of that brownfield stuff obviously is in countries that they already operate. You know, between North America and Australia, that's already 50% and another 20% for South America. And, and so that constant need to, uh, to generate reserves because you're constantly depleting reserves is something that you know, all resource companies have to deal with because these are non-renewable resources. And it's something everyone's looking at. You know, but what we've seen is through the mega mergers, we've seen them increase their reserve basis, like gold, uh, the acquisition of Gold Corp by Newmont added, I think it's about 40 million ounces to, uh, to Newmont's reserve base, which was around 60, 66. And now at the end of 19 was about 100 million ounces. So that, that acquisition has happened at the majors, but now I think what we've seen at the last year is a lot of these mid-tiers trying to move up. Okay, so the, the big majors, Barrett Gold and Newmont, they, they've, they've filled their pipelines to a certain extent with the recent mega mergers. So who is really in the position or who really needs to be buying or acquiring assets? Yeah, I don't know about who really needs to, but I, I think the philosophy for a lot of these mid-tiers is relevance. So how do I increase my rev relevance, my market cap, my liquidity, so people notice me? And then, you know, so so I, I what I'm doing is cutting my GNA, you know, using my synergies to lower my costs, increase my market cap, generate more free cash flow, do issue dividends, and you know, possibly get uh, attract dividend um, um, dividend yield seeking investors that I normally don't see because I usually see growth investors. And so to do that, that's part of the consolidation. So that's Taranga and Endeavor. You know, that would have been Northern Star and Saracen. Uh, uh, that would have been uh, like Alistair and SSR on mining. You know, a lot of these mid-tiers getting together and then building up to go to the next tier. You know, uh, and, and now they're consolidating asset, they've consolidated pipelines, and now they're going through all their projects trying to figure out which they'll keep, which they'll dump, that sort of thing. Um, and so that's something we've seen. And, and I think maybe now we're going to see more of the single asset uh, companies being acquired, which we have, you know, recently with Premier Gold being acquired by Equinox, ostensibly for the 50% stake in uh, the Hard Rock open pit gold project, which is permanent in Northern Ontario. And then more recently, you know, a bit of a white night by Agnico Eagle on TMAC Resources Hope Bay project in, uh, in none of it. Okay, so, um, you know, it sounds like, you know, Closology is one of the themes there. Um, Agnico Eagle has obviously got other assets in, um, in, in none of it in Canada. Um, are there any other sort of similarities or, or trends in the deals? And here I'm thinking of, you know, all cash deals, all share deals, premiums, that kind of thing. Okay, the type of transaction since the Rand Gold Barrick deal of the merger of equals, most of the big transactions has always had this title of merger of equals to make sure that all the uh, uh, investors know that nobody paid a premium, you know, uh, and then it was just a consolidation of share structure with, 
with we're cutting GNA. These people are going, we're staying. So that'll save us X amount of million dollars per year. And also now we have the synergies such that, you know, when I used to send my stuff to that plant over there. I went around these guys now. I'm going to their plant and that'll save me money. So all of that sort of stuff has made sense. And, and I think that's what strikes me the most of these acquisitions, the M&A deals that we've seen over the last year and a bit, um, you know, omitting some of the Chinese transactions uh, is that they, they make a lot of sense synergistically, whether it's Endeavor and Taranga, uh, whether it's Northern Star and Saracen, because they both own 50% of the same asset. You know, so a lot of that sort of makes sense. And, and, and that's, that I, I, I guess for me, that, that, that's, that's a good thing to see. It's a healthy thing to see in the, in the, in the gold mining industry. Do you, do you see more of those kind of transactions out there? Um, and, you know, what do you think of the, the potential pipeline of uh, potential acquisition targets? Are there any sort of standouts out there? Or is it a case that um, the acquirer really has to put in the sweat equity to, to generate value from the transaction? And here I'm thinking of something like TMAC, where um, there's Agnico Eagle's got to do a lot of work to get value out of that. Yeah, but, but if we go back to TMAC, specifically TMAC Hope Bay project, that underground project uh, that has had a lot of issues uh, uh, in none of it, um, it was you know technically acquired back in March. But the Investment Review Board of Canada basically said no to uh, the acquisition. And so, uh, um, you know, the company was caught off guard. Um, you know, they, they didn't actually, they generated free cash flow because they weren't doing a lot of underground development. Uh, they said flatly that they didn't have enough money for the next barge to come in with respect to inventory for the next uh, load, which was a lot of money. And also their new feasibility study required, I believe 400 million plus cumulatively over the next three plus years, uh, uh, you know, for a new plant in that. And so they weren't in a position uh, with respect to suitors to say, oh, what's, you know, uh, you know, we'll just wait, you know, we're doing fine. They weren't doing fine. So Agnico came in as a white knight uh, because comparatively they they do well in the Arctic. They've they've uh, you know uh, you know uh, managed a lot of mines in the Arctic, whether it's in Finland or in other assets in in none of it. But interestingly enough, you know the CEO said that this wasn't going to be easy, and so he was already setting. Uh, you know, sort of expectations for the market to say, hey, we didn't pay a lot, but still we're going to have to do a lot of work, like you said, uh, to actually, you know, make this an asset that's going to generate significant free cash flow going forward. I think one, one thing that's interesting there, um, a lot of the recent transactions, I think, you know, the last six or seven significant transactions have been for assets in Canada, particularly in Ontario and Quebec. And, you know, some of Agnico's peers have been picking up assets, you know, Yamana Gold picking up Wasamak, um, Alamos and Trillium, uh, El Dorado Gold and QMX. Uh, and there's been some sort of smaller companies, you know, Manetta, Porcupine, with Garrison, Goldshore Resources and Moss, um, Equinox and Hard Rock. So, um, you know, why, why has there been such a focus on Ontario and Quebec in Canada? Yeah, I, I would argue that the Equinox acquisition of Premier, uh, which was not only for Hard Rock, which, you know, that, that was the main asset, and also for the asset in Mexico, uh, they don't have any assets in Canada, uh, you know, of any significance. And so this was a major, you know, new asset required yeah. new jurisdiction and getting them a foothold here. Uh, whereas the other ones were more incremental transactions that were not unlike making brownfield exploration moves near your mine, you know, acquiring resources nearby to feed your plant, which, you know, like with Newmont, you know, their 230 million, you know, forecast expenditures for 2020, 80% of that was brownfields. And so a lot of this M&A that you're talking about, the small M&A is not unlike, you know, brownfield exploration. You're just acquiring the ounces, you know, you're through shares, potentially more so than the cash. Okay. Um, to sort of bring everything to a conclusion, how do you think this M&A landscape will evolve and develop this year? What kind of transactions do we expect to see? You know, are there going to be any sort of big surprises out there? Well, it's going to be choppy uh, because, um, you know, not only is it going to be suitor specific in terms of what they need, where they operate, 
uh, you know, uh, what their comparative advantage, oh, do I work well in the Arctic? Hey, I, I can handle assets in the jungle or hey, here's a jurisdiction that I've had, you know, that I've been able to permit, you know, successfully, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so when you, when you look at that and then layer on the COVID travel restrictions, you know, what we might see until the travel restrictions are lifted, which may not be until the fall, is a lot of these transactions where people are operating already or have people, have mines there that they can do the due diligence and do all their homework and acquire the asset so they can see the synergistic, you know, advantages of operating, of, of acquiring that asset. I, I don't see a lot of people, you know, acquiring acquiring a greenfield asset in a place they don't work in right now. I think that would be harder to execute given the travel restrictions uh, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, just to sort of follow up on that, you know, from your sort of previous experience, how, how many due diligence visits would a, a company typically make before it's ready to pull the trigger on a, on a, on a project or an asset? I would, I would say there would be several, you know, you might have, you know, some people look at the expiration upside. Uh, if, if that was an important part of the acquisition, some people want to know, can we operate this thing? So you would have, you know, the metallurgists go in to check the flow sheet. You would go, the miners would go in there to check out how they're mining it and to see if there's any way that they can improve upon what they're doing. They, oh, wow, we could do this much better than them. I could, you know, get the metal or you know, recovery up two or 3%, they're wasting a lot of money on reagents here, or, hey, we can use our supply chain to lower the costs. And so there's a lot of due diligence like that, depending on the company. If it's a very advanced asset, there'll be even more due diligence. If it's a grassroots explorer, you know, there'd be less due diligence. Okay, that's great. Well, that's unfortunately all we have time for today. So I'd like to thank Joe Mazumda for joining us and, and goodbye from me, Paul Harris. And stay tuned for more Mining Journal interviews. Thank you, Joe. Great. Thank you very much, Paul.